Holy Spirit, move in this place as you have been, Father. Lord, just as you've met us in worship, as you've met us in conversation, Lord God, even strategically, Father, now, move our hearts, Lord. We are all hungry for you. We are hungry to hear from you, Lord God. So bless our time together, Lord God. Your word says that when we come together, we are to proclaim who you are, Lord God, by breaking bread together. So sovereignly bless as we celebrate you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, yesterday, I, was, um, I had a full day. I was um, doing some ministry, and, and then there's a guy, Andrew. Andrew and I went to the movies, but there's a, the man that... Um, uh, one of the first pre people I led to Christ when I was in the ministry in the 80s. Um, he and I stay in touch. And uh, we went and saw that movie 12 Strong yesterday. A really good movie. And um, you'll, you'll enjoy it. Sorry, bud. I know we usually do this, but, you know, went with Andrew. <laughs> but um, so I had planned it and, and had outlined a message to because I wanted to talk about evangelism um, today. And I wanted to talk about the, the ministry of Stephen. Um, so I started laying out, I had done pre-research, and I'm laying out my notes, and, um, and all of a sudden I feel that tug from the Holy Spirit that says, no, I want you to do something else. And as a, as a theologian and a scholar, especially when I've done about nine hours of research, I'm like, well, that can't be God, because I've already done all my research. And so um, the Lord and I began to go forth because I soon discovered it was the Lord. So as I started to lay out my outline, it kept getting tugged to what you're about to have. And so finally at 8 o'clock last night, I relented and this thing came together. And, and um, I, I hope you enjoy because I, I really believe that the Lord wants us to celebrate who he is. Um, I shared this at the first service and um, Stacy, right away, she lit up. I go, what is she? she? goes, I just taught this exact same passage on Friday. And so she firmed up. She goes, this is really what God wants for me. So anyway, we're going to look at zeal for God's house. And we're going to discover this morning that we are God's house. And God wants you to be zealous about you and your heart for him and the place where he dwells, all right? He wants you to be passionate. And zeal, when you look even in your notes, it involves even a little jealousy that when something is yours, it's to, to the exclusion of everything else. And God wants you to know this morning how exclusive you are to him and that he loves you with a jealous love, Right? So we look at this, and, but how do we get here from our study in Stephen? And this is, this is what grabbed me yesterday afternoon and got me on this course. It was verses 13 and 14 in Acts. Go ahead and go to that. And so I'm studying, getting ready for this evangelistic message, and I get this, and I get to this part. This fellow Stephen never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. And the circumstance that we're going to study next week is that Stephen um, is, is one of the seven, we learned last week, that was appointed to help with food distribution among the Hellenistic Jews. You know, there's the, the Israeli Jews, and then there's the Jews from around the world. And God takes a problem last week and creates an opportunity for the church to be very representative and cosmopolitan of the world. It's a beautiful thing. Instead of fragmented, the church comes together. So these guys, these seven guys from, from the Hellenistic group, they, they distribute this food program. But in, as they get their hands busy in ministry, Stephen discovers that he, he's really good at talking about God. Isn't that interesting? So he's doing one thing. He's serving people in ministry but he's talking about Jesus and he finds out, you know, I'm pretty good at talking about God. And so he begins to publicly among his Christian friends and among his non-Christian Hellenists, he begins to talk about the power of Jesus. And that's next week's message. Powerful. But as he's doing this, there was this complaint among the Hellenists that were not Christians and are saying, you know, Stephen, he never stops talking. He never stopped talking, but he, he speaks against the temple, and he speaks against Moses and the law. For we have heard Stephen say that this Jesus that he talks about 
is going to destroy this place and change the custom Moses handed down to us. Again, that's a great message for next week, which we're going to talk about. But my mind started going, goes, well, Jesus will destroy this place. Where did that message come from? John chapter 2, that's where we are. Okay, look at this. And that's my segue that got me into this. I just wanted you to know why I was thinking. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He has just changed water into wine. I think it was a Cabernet. It was awesome, <laughs> right? And he, he's at a wedding, and it's his first miracle. Um, many believe that when they study the word, that there wasn't one time that Jesus cleared the temple, but it was twice. Because at the beginning of his ministry, this happens, and towards the end of the ministry, both in Matthew and Luke, they record another time that Jesus clears the temple, all right? So in this inaugural beginning of the ministry, Jesus goes to the temple in Jerusalem, and he sees something that just gets him going. Right? It says, Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. Now, leave it there. This is normal. Passover, people are coming from all over Israel, outside of Israel. You know, the Hellenistic Jews are coming too. And, and they're wanting to make their sacrifice to be right to God. So... It's like anything else. When you arrive at the airport, if you're flying internationally, you got to change your money to the local currency. So that's normal. And so that's not the bad part. Secondly, if people are traveling, they're not going to haul their sacrificial animals hundreds of miles. They're going to bring money, and they're going to want to buy it there. Okay? So this is not the part. That, so this is normal. So he sees normal in the temple area. There's something that's not normal. Go on. Verse 15. When he, had made, when he had made a whip of cords, already you're going, wow, God, what's up? So the Lord walks in and sees something that he doesn't like. So he walks to the side and puts together a whip. Okay? Now, it doesn't take rocket science to go, the Lord's kind of upset about something. Can we all agree? He's making a whip. He drove them all out of the temple. So literally in the court of the Gentiles, he clears it out. He, he drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. Quite a spectacle. Did I, did I put a picture in there? And, um, and this is just um, by Theodore Rombouts. And I like this picture because some of the pictures, depending on the, 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 um, the artistic period, they're, they're, it's, they're featuring women. And it's just, they're, they're just, it's just more about the, the sexual portrayal. Um, other one, it's just he's, he's about to hit a woman. I go, no, that's not what's going on. And I like this picture because the Lord's very purposed in this. Of course, this is not how they're dressed. This is more a period piece. But you see these guys that are caught up in their money. You see them disheveled. And, it, and I think it accurately picks up the fact that people are freaking out because this guy's very purpose, and he's saying, get out of my house. So I, so I like the way that Rombouts takes and go ahead and grabs this. Okay, go back to the scripture, Arlen. Thank you very much. And so we were at, um, he made a whip of cords. He drove them out of the temple and with the sheep and the oxen. So not only their, their tables, he overturns them and all their livestock. He's just saying, get out of the temple courtyard. And he overturned the tables. Keep going. Verse 16. And he said to those who sold doves, and we'll highlight this. Many of you know this, but um, I'll repeat myself. Doves were a poor man's offering. The majority of the tables sold doves because the majority of the people were poor. So there's a lot of these dove tables. So the first um, that John records is speaking is that God is, Jesus is driving all these people, but he says to the guys that are doing this, take these things away, these doves. Do not make my father's house a, ha a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remember that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Okay, let's pause right here. So we already said it was normal during the Passover to walk into the court of the Gentiles and see all these merchants. There's money changers here. There's, there's the, um, for those who can afford it, there's, there's sheep and, and those kind of sacrifices. Then for the poor people, there's the dove offerings. 
The dove section is really big. We've already established that. So walking in would be normal. So what did the Lord see that wasn't normal? Many scholars, when they research this, they believe that what was happening is that people were paying double for what was going on. It was a market opportunity because everybody was there. Remember I described to you a couple weeks ago that in the priesthood, there's about, um, on Passover, there's 18,000 workers there. There's the high priest, and then there's the 200 priests whose positions they had to buy. So it's not, so this is rich people that are running it. These guys also organized the commerce that was going on in the courtyard. So these guys are double charging everybody. As they exchange money, they're taking their money. As they buy their sacrificial animals, they're charging an amount. And especially here with the poor people, they don't have that much money. That's why they're going doves. They're double charging them too. So the Lord sees this and he's like, <laughs> he goes in the back. He's spending time with his father in heaven. And I just want to tell you, there's only one person, past, present, and future, that can be righteously angry. And that's Jesus Christ. The rest of us, you know, no matter how upset we get at something that's going wrong, you never want to act in anger because we don't have a handle on our anger like the Son of God. Can I just say that? I'm righteously indignant. I'm acting because I have a righteous reason to do this. Take a breath. Take a step back. The Son of God makes this, and He purposely drives everybody out, and, and He makes a point. He goes, do not make my father's house. People are coming here to, to touch God, to receive forgiveness, to feel a sense of relief from the burden of sin. Right? You come here with an expectation. Right? And we do our best to set a table to meet that expectation. We want to hear from God. We want to experience his presence. You want to know that your kids are safe. Right? And we do our best. There's always ways to improve, right? But the Lord saw something at his house that day, and he says, this is not appropriate. This is not right. And he says, you know what? The best way to fix it is you all get out of here. Do not take these poor people coming in and use them because you want to make some money today. And he drives them out. Zeal for his house has eaten me up. A little bit more. Verse 18. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? In the NIV it'll say it'll, he goes, what sign can you show us to say that you have the authority to do this? Now, let's take a step back. At church, which is called the house of God, they're so into what they're doing that now God is there, God walks in, and he doesn't like what he sees. So these priests look at God, and they say, God, what authority do you have? And I don't want you to get off. Lord, what authority do you have to clear out your house? Show us a sign that you have the authority to speak into this. Can you imagine the arrogance? Human beings going to the living God, Jesus, who's walking this earth and saying, what's your authority to clean your own house? And we don't think of it that way because we're just watching a bunch of angry men. But look at what the anger and the religious spirit and, and, and the, the, the need for money has done. It has blinded them to the very idea that Jesus, God, is right in front of them and they're caught up in making money off of people that are hungering for God. You hear what I'm saying? And lately, I've been looking at the Word, and I've just been really humble, like, gosh, Lord, you really love us. That us humans would have so much arrogance that we could challenge you face-to-face -face in so many ways. As if we're on equal footing with you. Lord, what gives you authority to speak in my life today? Lord, what gives you authority? You know, I know your Word says this, but I don't, I don't like this part of the Bible. Or I'm not feeling really a peace about your, what you're telling me. So I'm going to take a step back, and I don't know if I'm going to listen to you, because I need peace about your word and your authority. 
and your rule in my life. And I'm like, gosh, 2100, century, 2,100 years later, we still have the audacity to go, get back to you, God. To God. What sign do you have? What, what authority do you have, God, to do this in your own house? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll raise it up. Next slide. Then the Jesus, Jews said, you know what, God, and he, I'm, forgive my, I'm pushing his point because they don't recognize that he's God. But the audacity to say, it took us 46 years to build this temple. What makes you think you can do it in three days? But Jesus was speaking at the temple of his body. Talk about totally missing a conversation. And finally, verse 22, it says, Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Powerful story. And when you look at your notes, there's something very um, just basic that I want you to catch as we get ready to break bread together. First of all, that I put, it, I put in your notes that, that there's only one sign that God gives us, that gives us, that he says is the authority for him to do it. It's in 1 Corinthians 15, and that sign is the cross. The Bible says this, For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also receive. Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures, he was buried and he rose, here it is, on the third day. Jesus said, give me three days. I'll do it in three days. That's the heart of what we believe. It's not some long process or anything else. He says, here's what I'll do. I'm going to die on a cross for your sins once for all. And just so you wonder, I'm going to physically die and be buried. And then on the third day, I'm going to rise again according to the word of God. That's the authority of Jesus Christ, the cross. But not just the cross, the empty tomb on a Sunday. That's all the authority that we need right? Point two, look in your notes. I put in, um, in, in the comment on point two, my father's house is not a market. Jesus is standing in the physical temple, and next week we're going to, one of the things that is incredible about Stephen's delivery is Stephen, the people believe, the arrogance of man believes you can build a structure and then say, come here, God, come here, come here, God. You sit over here, and you stay here, God. This is the house of God. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, I've gone to different places, and I, I can't wait to do a cathedral tour of Europe and see these wonderful cathedrals that are just immaculate. I want to go to Rome, you know? I want, right, Tim? You saw Sistine, uh, Apple, you've seen it before? You've been there places. You see these incredible places, and they're gorgeous. And it's like you feel awestruck. Right? I've been at Crystal Cathedral back in the old days, the, the one made of glass in California. And you can't help but feel the presence of God when you're in this beautiful building. But you know what? That's not the only place where God is. The arrogance of man insists that God is here, or God's in the Vatican, or God's over here. And, and he is. But what had happened at the time of Christ is they believed that God was nowhere else but in the temple of Jerusalem. This is where God is. So when God walks into his house and they go, whoa, he go, you know, he goes, Jesus says, he goes, he goes, I could do it in three days. Why is that? Because Jesus says this thing. He identifies with the fact that he's the temple of God. Why? Because he's God. But when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there's a segue that happens in your life. And the Bible says this, do you not know that you and I are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Can you imagine the honor that those three days has given you and I now? That's what we celebrate today when we have communion. That the God of the universe puts his presence in you. 
And I just want that to resonate with you for a minute. And it's not in every human being. That's universalism. We don't believe that. The Bible says this in 1 John. I mean in John chapter 1. But as many as receive him, to, to them he gave the right. It is a right and a privilege to house the presence of God. Catch that. Oh, no, everybody's made the image. Yeah, we're made in the image of God. But God honors you and says you have the choice to invite his presence in and become a temple of the Lord. That he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. You receive him, you believe him, who are born, not of blood. It's not a physical right. Not of the will of the flesh, okay? It's not that we can determine it for our children. Nor of the will of man, right? It's just like, you know, oh, it's just, I'm just going to happen. But it's of God. That, that all these things happen and God sets up in Revelation 3.20, which is not there. It says, the, the king of the universe stands at the door of your heart and he knocks and he waits. If anyone would hear the voice and I say, Lord, come into my life. You're welcome into my life. Then he'll come. The God of the universe gives you, Mark, as a choice to say, Jesus, I want you in my life. But once he does, God considers you his temple. So look at the points that I made here. Number one, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do this? It's the sign of the cross. My father's house is not a market. And the third point that we have here this morning is I'm not for sale. If we truly believe we're the house of God, then we, not, we need to make a decision not to put ourselves up for sale. The Bible says this in 2 Timothy 2. And we'll end with this. In a moment, Tim, we'll end. In a great house, that is what we are, housing a great God when we've invited him in. There are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, the dishonorable stuff, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. And the heart of what God is calling us, I believe, this morning, and I was wrestling with this, as I've been reminded this week especially, I was talking to my mentor um, on Friday, one of my mentors, and um, he asked me, how's your week going? And in my typical Honolulu excited voice, I just said, oh, this is happening, and Journey's doing this, and all this, because I'm so excited about what God's doing in our church. And then he goes, how's your marriage? Oh, Brenda and I are doing this and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just excited about what Vern and I are doing. And he goes, and how the kids? Oh, you know, Jordan's this and Jeremy's that because it's just fun. And I just had the grandkids. And I'm excited. And I'm going blah, 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 blah. And I'm going. And Tom goes, time out. I go, what's up? He goes, he goes I gather you're really excited about your life. And he goes, yeah. He goes, he goes, he goes how are you doing with the Lord? I said, well, I'm excited. I'm excited about Journey, and I'm excited about Brenda and the kids and, and my grandkids. And, I, and he, goes, he goes, how's your time with the Lord right now? And so I said, well, 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 let me check. And I got my journal. I hadn't written my journal in a week. And you know me. I'm a very disciplined journal person. And he goes, I go, well, I've been reading the Bible. He goes, yeah, it sounds like it. I go, I'm faithfully reading. He goes, but have you stopped to listen to him this week? I said, well, I kind of figured he's been speaking to me, so I'm doing all this stuff. And he goes, stop and listen to him. This message is a product because I didn't stop and listen to him till 8 o'clock last night this whole week. I bring that to you as your pastor and confess that to you. And the message God told me is, you know what, John? You're a great house. And I filled you with gold. You've got some other stuff in there. And in love, we need to get it out. And the only way you're going to hear it is if you trust me enough and let's walk around the house. And you know what? I'll talk, you listen. And because my mentor told me on Friday, he goes, you know what? It sounds like your life's going great and everything, but you need to take a long walk with the Lord and just hear him this week. Slow down. It's in your voice. Slow down. Hear me. So this morning as we take communion, I urge you to invite the Spirit of the Lord to hear as he would just say, hear me today. 
I don't know if the message for you is to slow down. I know that's what God told me. But hear from God that you are a great house, dear ones. You are a great house if you know Jesus. And you are a vessel destined to be a vessel of honor. That's God's fate for you today and tomorrow and every day. But would you invite the Spirit of the Lord to point out the things that He so wonderfully loves in your life today, but also to point out the things that you say, you know, maybe it's time to move that one out of your life. Because when we do that, we're set apart and useful for the Master. It's like a, when you reach into your toolbox and you need that tool really bad and you discover that you didn't wash it off the last time you used it. So you can't do the job because it's still covered with junk. Versus take the time to take something out, wipe it off really good, use it, wipe it off again and get it ready. Because when God needs you, you can be useful to the master. When your friend calls you and they're hurting because you're filled up with the spirit, you can hear God and respond in the way that you need to. When your children are hurting, you can take a pause and hear what God wants you to do or say or not do or say in the moment. Sometimes the greatest help we can give someone else is say, hey, you know what, I'm not going to do that for you. You go back and ask God what he wants you to do. Us parents are the great fixers, the great credit card pull-outers, the great money thing, the great this, and we need to teach the next generation that it's not always that fast and that quick and that easy. It's taken too long. It's taken three days, Dad. Well, it's probably going to take 30. I can't do that. Yes, you can. I'm going to invite you up to him. We're going to have communion this morning. And could somebody go ahead and grab the kids and just let the kids know that we want to bring them back in? And we're not going to pass it out. We're going to wait till the kids get here. But Tim's going to begin to play, and I just want you to reflect on the Word of God today. In a moment, your children are going to come in, for those of you who have them. And they're going to get a, a cracker and a, and a juice. Hold on, Burn, wait till everybody comes. And I'm going to explain what's going on. Because the Bible says that when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim Jesus. Not a great man, Jesus, but Jesus who died on the cross, who physically rose from the dead, whose blood was shed to pay for our sin, past, present, and future. That's what communion is all about. We celebrate that because of Christ, and we, when we accept him as Lord and Savior, it's not automatic. That's why for some of your children, just because they're in church, it doesn't mean it's automatic. We take time to unpack that at some point we say, you know what, Lord, I'm a sinner. And I fall short of glory, I'm sorry. And God, I can't. My effort will not get me to heaven. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your blood that was shed. It's not my blood that gets me, it's not my effort. It's yours. And so, receiving you is, I believe in the cross. And I believe that you paid the price for my sin. And I thank you. And you died, you fully paid for it. So I'm forgiven. But then you also, by rising from the dead, you said, you know what? Life begins with forgiveness. It begins with forgiveness. And as much as you love your kids, you cannot make them do that. Because they own their hearts. You can guide them and show them. You cannot guarantee that they've done that. It is their decision. So every time we do this, every month, you model that with them. Some people say, well, they can't have communion until they've accepted the Lord. I'm going to leave that up to you. If they don't know Jesus, they're just having a cracker and juice. If they know the Lord, they're proclaiming who Jesus is. Whether or not you want them to partake or not, that's your decision, okay? That's your heart as parents. That's what you do. As Christians, we proclaim, we declare, we invite the power of God into our lives. What is the unworthy manner of communion? 
It's when someone knows that we're proclaiming who Jesus is and they defiantly want to do it anyway. Just to be defiant. That's the unworthy manner. Oh, Pastor John, but I've had a sinful life this week and I don't deserve the, 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 to do communion. May I tell you, you're being lied to. If you've had a sinful life this week, you need the table of God. You need to celebrate something that God gave you freely that in spite of your sin, his blood still forgives you. That's okay. They're doing great. I don't mind. This is a part of who journey is, and this is a part of life. That's why I wanted to explain to you. So gather your kids around you, all right? And we're almost ready. Is everybody in? Is the last class in? They're coming. Okay. Do you hear what I'm saying? And you know what, Mom and Dad, aunts and uncles, you can do this. So we're going to pass it out. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a moment. And then you pray over your children. You have communion with them. If any of you are here and you're not with anybody, make sure you, you participate. So like Enid, you got the aunties right here, Mom and, and Esther. Make sure you're together. Um, you folks have just come. But just bless one another. and But just make sure that you're not alone in having communion, okay? Some of us were waiting for somebody to ask us. And that's part of the thing. Find somebody else that's also waiting to be asked, and one of you ask each other, can we do this together? All right? My high school kids, some of you are, you, you do things by yourself. You find another one that hasn't doing that, okay? But let's not be alone. Okay, so we're waiting for it. Brent, go ahead and pass out, and Apple, go ahead, and we'll wait for this last group. So everybody, if you if you're, if you're want to, and if you don't want to, you don't have to, but take a, a cracker and a juice, So be patient, we'll get there. So okay, okay, we're waiting for one more group of kids. Is that Lucas kids? Thanks, bro. And then Brenda after, why don't you come up and I'll have communion with you? You're very lucky. I'm just kidding. I just, it's just important that we do this as a family today. Anna, the, and right after that, bring your worship team up. But you know what? You, you never get to break bread with your mom and dad. So just enjoy it, okay? You never get to. You guys okay? Even my worship team, they're going to do communion, then we'll worship after. Leah, you'll get up here in a second, okay? But go ahead and be with mom. Everybody find your parents, find your family, find your family. Everybody together? Okay, if, and, um, you all set? You with mom? Got it? Okay. Do you need any more? Anybody, do you need communion? Evan up there? Okay. Brenda, is there any more? Do we still have? Okay. Okay. Arlen, Melissa, you're together. You got you got everybody? Good. Okay. And again, throughout the year, I want to make a big deal about this day in our in our church. Is that okay? I want to make a big deal about this. There and then make sure you're with your husband at work. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Apple. And I think just Ramirez is up there, and I think we're done, right? Thank you, Apple. It's comforting, yeah, to have Tim on the piano. Isn't that nice? 
gosh. We've been doing this for years together. And here's the other thing, the formalism. You don't have to stand up to do communion, okay? Do whatever is convenient so that your family is looking at one another in the eye, okay? If it's sitting is better for you, then do that. If gathering off, if you want to move off, if you're fine, but whatever works. But I'm going to give you a moment. So for those of you that have your kids, are you in a place that you can do it together? Is that good for you? All right. Here we go. Where are you, Vern? Come on up. anybody not have one? Okay. So you're going to hear it when the groovers are going to do it together, you're going to hear a pause in the music, okay? But, but that's because they're going to have communion. So, um, okay, here we go. The Bible says this, dear ones, on a night before Jesus died, he took bread and he gave thanks to his Father in heaven. And then he passed it out to his friends, his disciples, and said, Take this and eat of you, for this is my body, which is broken for you. Now, we know it's not his physical body, and you're not eating that. But it represents what God proclaimed in that temple at the beginning of his ministry at the end. He made a declaration of what the house of God is to be like. A body broken, a blood shed, that it's not a place of merchandising. It's not for sale. The blood of Jesus and the body of Christ makes you and I the temple of his presence. And now you're a grand house. So parents, as you're telling your kids right now, thank you, Jesus, for your body, which was broken on the cross. And as I take this cracker, I see and believe, Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I thank you for that, your body broken. Go ahead and take that. Now, furthering that in Jesus' name, it says that at the end of the meal, he took a cup filled with wine. Parents, relax. Grape juice is on the agenda. But he said, this, this, this cup represents my blood that was shed. See, because in Bible times, it says um, when there was something that was done wrong, only blood could pay the price for sin. So they were discovering that the blood of animals was only week to week to week. And every week, it just never quite did it. So the blood of Jesus, he died once for all. And that's what we believe. So because of the blood of Jesus, get this, and I'm going to throw a term at you, eternally forgiven. Eternally forgiven. Eternally forgiven. We might not always feel this with one another, but the blood of Jesus says you are eternally forgiven. And we celebrate the fact that when you die, you know what? Heaven. Heaven. Son and daughter of God, heir to the King of kings and Lord of lords, you have peace with God. You're not condemned. The blood of Jesus, heir to the promises of God. A grand house, a house of opportunity, a house of hope. So Lord, as I take this cup, I thank you, Lord. I declare that your blood was shed for me. I am forgiven. I'm a child of God. I'm an heir to the King of kings and Lord of lords. I have eternal life destined for me, Lord. I drink this cup and I say thank you that I'm a child of God. Go ahead and do that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whatever else you want to pray over your kids, I want to invite the worship team up. We're going to do a couple songs. You know, it's a little different, but now we're going to worship the Lord who has forgiven us. With your kids, let's just keep it solemn, not a talk time, but let's just worship God together now. Can we do that? <laughs>